Today, Lisa is here to talk to us about the discovery of the structure of DNA, which, of course, despite sounding very much like a biological discovery, involves a great deal of very important physics. So without further ado, I shall pass it over to Lisa. Thank you, Jacob. I'm just going to check my microphones on. Yes, so um, uh, Isaac Physics is all my fault, not quite. Uh, I founded it with another person, uh, so um, don't, don't hold that against me when you're listening to this lecture today. I do hope that you do use it and um, that it, you find it helpful in your studies. Um, so yes, we are here today to talk about the Get my mouse to work. There we go. That's a good start. Uh, the discovery of the structure of DNA. And I've called this the A to Z of diffraction. So we are going to be talking about diffraction in this lecture. And I hope by the end of the lecture, you've re you will realise why I've called it the A to Z of diffraction, or the A to Z, if you prefer, of diffraction. So let's start with a little bit of history and we're going to start in the beginning. But one caveat, one thing I want to make you aware of is a lot of the phenomenon that we refer to by a person's name in physics is attributed to one particular person. But in actual fact, there are many people that did preliminary discoveries before that. So, for example, Thomas Young is quite often uh, associated with double slit diffraction, Young's double slits, for example. But there's a lot of background work that went into that and a lot of people that contributed to the understanding of the nature of light um, before him uh, and around him. So do be aware, when you've got a name of a phenomenon, it's not necessarily just the work of that particular individual. How many of you have seen a double slit diffraction pattern? Can you put your hand up, please? Okay, great, good. We're off to a good start in that case. Um, now, the story goes that people were interested in determining, is light a particle or a wave? And there were two camps. There was the light is a particle camp, and there is light is a wave camp. And this image on the screen is a reason for the evidence, if you like, for the uh, light is a particle camp. Can anybody tell me why looking at a picture like this might be argument for light is a particle? Go on, right at the back. Shadows mean that light can't go around the... Yeah, so light can't go around the ob ob objects, light travels in a straight line, and therefore where there's a gap, the particle can travel through and we see a bright spot, a bright patch, but where it's blocked, it can't travel through it, and we'd see a dark spot. So that was evidence for light is a particle. Now, you probably, well, you, from Jacob's description of what I did, I was doing cosmological simulations of galaxy formation. I'm a theoretical physicist. However, and I'm sure, I hope, that many of you in the audience are also aspiring to be theoretical physicists. But please don't think that that means you don't need to do any experiments, okay? Because theories are not worth the paper they are written on unless you can demonstrate by experiment that they actually mean something and that they actually have some predictive behavior. So to give you my example of simulating galaxies, what was I trying to do? I was trying to simulate in a computer the formulation, of, uh, sorry, the formation of the Milky Way from the Big Bang so from about 100,000 minutes after the Big Bang. So my theories were using observations in order to say whether my theories were correct. So one of the challenges of string theory, string theory makes no testable predictions. So from the theorist perspective, that's great because nobody can prove them wrong, um, but also nobody can prove them right. So here is Young's double slit experiment. So we've got light coming through two slits. Quite often in experiments, you see this done with a laser, hence the little rig we've got at the back there. Um, and what you see are, if we had a perfect, infinitely thin set of double slits, we would get a regular bright and dark pattern like you see in this image here, with equal separation all the way along. That may not be what you've seen when you've seen double slits, and there's a very good reason for that. Your teachers are amazing, but I don't think they can make infinitely thin double slits. 
And so what you will see is something on top of this pattern, and that's what we're going to talk about. So where do Young's double slits come from? Well, they are an argument and evidence for the other camp, the light is a wave camp. And so if we look at my diagram here, we've got two slits, and these waves are representing the light wave, and this is the screen that we're looking at. Okay? And so what we see is in this geometry here, this wave doesn't travel as far as this wave. And so these two um, parts of the, of the light have come from the same source. So this one has the same wavelength as this one. But because it's had to travel further, it's done an extra technical term wiggle along the way. Okay? And so what that means is when it gets to the screen, one of them's in a minimum and one of them's in a maximum. And when we add those two things together, we get no light. We get um, destructive interference. Whereas in this case, we've moved a bit further along the screen. So if we were to look there, that dark spot would be here. We've moved a bit further out. And because we've moved further out, this path has got longer. And so the difference now is greater. And so they're now minimum and minimum or maximum and maximum. And we see a bright spot. So as we move along this screen, at this central point here, they are traveling an equal distance. So their brightness adds, their intensity adds. And as we move along this screen, this one is the one that's fixed. And this is the one that's getting longer and longer and longer. And so as we move along, in some places it adds to make a maximum, and in some places it cancels to make a dark spot. You may have seen this in other places. So this is a wave tank, and it has two little um, spherical ball bearings, if you like, on the end of arms, and they are dipping in the water to create spherical ripples. And what you see is as they do that, we've got the spherical ripples. I'm hoping that my laptop pen is going to work on this. You can see where there are bright or constructive waves and where there are, that's possibly not the best color, so let's choose a different color, where there are minima, where they have canceled out. And then if I was good at drawing equal distances, you would see the next one, there's another maximum. And then there's another minimum. And so this is exactly the same idea. And a person called Huygens gave us a way of understanding, linking this idea of real physical waves. These are surface waves, which is an important point. But these real physical waves to perhaps the way in which we can interpret how light is behaving. And so what Huygens says was that ev these are called a wave front. So this is a peak, a peak, a peak, a peak. Every point on that wave front acts as a source of spherical wavelets. So when this wave front gets to these two slits, this bit can't carry on, this bit can't carry on, but the bit that can go through the slit here is like a point source, like those things dipping on the surface of the water that create spherical wavelets that propagate. And the same is true at this one, spherical wavelets that propagate. And then what we see is where the peaks, so these lines represent peaks in the light, they add up to make a bright spot or a bright line in our um, diffraction pattern and where they cancel out is where we see the dark line. So that's another way of interpreting, but it's additional evidence that actually wave, uh, sorry, light could be a wave. Now, many of you are in year 12 and many of you have told me you're doing further maths. Excellent. Okay, so that's the interpretation. Now let's do some of the real theory. 
So again, same diagram, still talking about Young's double slits, but we're going to get a little bit more detailed about it. So if we have a separation between our slits of D, exactly the same idea. We've got one part of the wave, well, one wave coming this way and one wave coming this way. So hopefully you agree with me that this bottom one, R2, is longer than R1. So there is what we call a path difference. There is a different thing that in the length of the path depending on which slit the light we're considering the light has gone through. I won't go into quantum mechanics at this point, I don't think. Right. Okay. So if there is a path difference, if you remember, imagine drawing those wiggly lines on the top here, what that means is that they may or may not add or cancel depending on the path difference between them. And what that means is, if the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths, we get peak adding to peak. So we get bright spot. If the difference between them is half a wavelength, then we get peak and trough, and they cancel out. So when they add together, peak and peak, or actually trough and trough as well, because intensity is amplitude squared, then the path difference is equal to a whole number of wavelengths. And this d sine theta, bit of Pythagoras, if you look at my right angled triangle here, it's my right angled triangle. This angle here is theta, and this angle here is the, uh, this length here is the hypotenuse, d. So the path difference is this little bit. Yellow is not now a good choice. The path difference is this little bit. This is opposite the angle. Opposite over hypotenuse is sine. Okay. So the path difference is d sine theta. And for the waves to add, it has to be a whole number of wavelengths. Now we've got another triangle in here. Got another triangle that is this big, long triangle with this angle theta. And what we say is there is an approximation that we can make that if this screen is a very, very long way away, for example, when the laser is there and the screen is here, that counts as a long way away, then what that means is we've got another right angle triangle. And this time we've got opposite over adjacent, which is tan. But if the angle is very, very small, that's approximately the same as sine theta. And so we can say opposite y over d is approximately sine theta, which is approximately theta in radians if the angle is small. So that's where we've got to here. So sine theta is approximately y over d, opposite over adjacent, because it's approximately equal to tan. And so we now stick that in there. We replace the sine theta with um, the y over d, and we rearrange for y where y is the distance we're moving across the screen. So as we measure from this central point here, as we measure y, we can draw where the minima and maxima are. But the most important and interesting thing about diffraction is its reciprocal behavior. So this distance is larger when the separation between the slits is small. It's got an inverse behavior that means that w the thing that we shine the laser through, the smaller it is, the bigger the pattern that we see. An experimentalist dream. Life doesn't usually work like that. Usually the thing that you really want to do is too tiny to see. But using diffraction, the thing that's too tiny to see, if we shine a laser through it, becomes a massive thing that we can measure really easily. I'll show you an example of that in a second. So this is an inversely proportional relationship. So remember that. The separation between the slits is inversely proportional to the separation, the spread of the pattern. So if you like, here's one I prepared earlier, but I am going to show you the real thing live, but it's always good to have a backup. <clears throat> 
So this is a real double slit pattern. And what we said for double slits was they are equal brightness and equal separation. What do you notice as we go towards the edges? Anybody notice anything? Yeah? Yeah, the brightness is slowly dimming as you go out. And that's because over here, there is actually another what we call minimum. There's another dark spot for a different reason. More on that later. Right, this is a good point to test our plan. Where's Jacob? Excellent. Can you pop your phone in the... So I have made tonight's lecture in terms of technology as complicated as I possibly could. Um, so let's see how we, how we get on. There's Jacob. So on the screen, on the screen on the left, you are going to see me playing with a laser. OK, and you're going to see what I'm doing. On this screen up here, you are going to see the diffraction pattern. All right. And Jacob is going to come and do the technology down here to turn things on and off as required. All right. Best laid plans. We'll do our best. How are you doing, Jacob? OK. Right. Sorry you're in the image. If you wish to, if you wish to move, you're very welcome. But. Right. So, I'm going to get my key out, the po out of my pocket so that I can turn the laser on. Then. And um, just, before I, uh, just before I do that, I do want to show you what we're going to be working with today. This is a Cavendish special. Um, Visualizer two to the left screen if you have. Okay, this is a Cavendish special. This is um, a, a diffraction plate of apertures, and you'll have to give it just a second to focus. It will get there, but it has a moment. Okay, so what you can see on here is I have a, a whole array of apertures that I can play with. And so what I'm going to show you at the moment is this second column in here, which is double slits. And what happens with these double slits is the separation gradually increases. OK? So let's see what happens, or at least I think that's what it does. But we'll see from the diffraction pattern. OK, we'll leave that one there. OK. So if I turn my light on, the light backlights the laser for me so that I can see where my laser, which aperture my laser is going through. And with a bit of luck, I have a screen in the way at the moment to protect um, the people sitting at the front. And uh, I want to go down. So here is our, hopefully, oh, Actually, that's even more complicated than two slits. OK, so I'm actually going to show you something even more complicated than two slits. But let's give that a go. Jacob, could you, um, could you turn the lights off for me? Thank you. There we go. All right. So it's, it's the, the laser light is traveling a very long way, and so it gets dim because it's spread out by the time it gets to that screen. Um, but what you're actually looking at there is, um, is a double slit pattern. But what do you notice? So we saw the same in the pattern in the middle. What do you notice? There's about five slits, uh, five intensity bits there before it starts to go dim again. And this is for exactly the reason that I said I'm also brilliant, but not brilliant enough to make infinitely thin double slits. And so that five slits and then it goes dim, so five intensity bits and then it goes dim, that dimness is due to the fact that those double slits actually have a width. And we will come on to that in a second. But what you will see me play with today is lots of different slits. So we, you can maybe have a look. 
if I go onto a different slit, what do you see now? Can anybody describe what they see? I'll turn this little light off and then I can maybe see it. Any, I can't see any hands, so you might just have to shout out at this point. Oh, oh see, sorry, they can't, yeah, thank you. It's, it might be brighter. If you look between the bright spots in the middle, can you see anything? There's a dot between the broader dark spots. And what that actually means is we now no longer have two slits, but we have three slits. And so it's imp even I, using the zoom on the camera at the front, could not see how many slits there were. As soon as I have a diffraction pattern, because of this inverse relationship, I can tell straight away from the diffraction pattern what I'm looking at in the aperture. OK, can we have some lights on, Jacob, before I fall down the stairs? That would be great. Marvellous, thank you. So we will come back to... We will come back to more in that little aperture thing in a second. Set the, um, the PC to the left-hand screen. Did you want the visualiser back up? Uh, not just at the moment, should be all right. So I'll leave you to it then. Thank you. So, now let's look at a single slit. So you might think, well, actually, a single slit, surely that's more straightforward than a double slit. But actually, it's a, it's a little bit more involved. And I've put my laser pointer down somewhere, but never mind. Um, <clears throat> So we've got this particular case, thank you, where now this is just a single slit but what we're going to do is we're going to divide it up because what Huygens told us is every bit inside this slit is a little point that acts as a source of uh, these secondary wavelets and every point that's a source of secondary wavelets is going to interfere just like those two dabbers on the surface of the water did. And so we're going to split it in half and we're going to pair this top one with the one at the middle and then the second one with the one next down and we're going to go across the whole slit like that. And so all we're going to look at for the moment is this length four compared with this length three. And this time, this isn't D, this is now A over two. It's half the gap width. But the process is then the same. The thing that we're interested in is this little black arrow here, the path difference. If the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths, then it adds constructively. But I'm actually now going to say, well, actually, where does this destruct? Where are the dark spots in this single slit diffraction pattern? We go through the same process of looking at the same triangles. And what we find once again is the diffraction pattern for a single slit, the distance it spreads out along the screen is proportional to, inversely proportional to the size of the slit. So the bigger the slit, what can you tell me about the pattern? It's narrow, it's more squished together. I'm using lots of technical terms today. Um, squished together, all those sorts of things. Now, So, go back to my little diffraction grating, try and get it to have a little bit of a focus. Go on, you know you want to, there we go. So, this row on the very right hand side here is slits of different width. So, the one at the top is the widest and the one at the bottom is the narrowest. So, as I go to the laser and I go down this column, what are we going to see happen to the pattern? It should, sorry, my hand's moving around. It might make you feel a bit seasick. It should get wider because the wider the slit, the narrower the pattern. This inverse relationship with... So let me... Jacob and I are going to do a swap again. Doing my 10,000 steps today. Up and down the lecture theatre, right. So 
So now we're going to go to the top of this um, grating aperture set and I should be on slip number one which is at the top. Let's see how we go. Okay, we're good to turn the lights off, Jacob, if you will, please. If you could just blank the screens for me, that might help as well. So as you can see, or maybe certainly hopefully the people at the front, there are minima in that pattern, but they are tiny. The separation of them is tiny. So as I go down this um, pattern, as I go down this set of slits, and it's taking a steady hand, but let's see how we get on. Hopefully what you see, that's the next widest, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And that one's a little bit tricky because it really is rather wide, and it's almost as wide as the laser dot is itself. So evidence, um, experimental evidence that the theory about the way in which light behaves as a wave seems to be telling us something sensible. And so, let's skip to here. So what we've got here is a single slit, and these are images of what you just saw me do exactly. At the very, very beginning, the slit was very wide. W was a big amount, relatively, and therefore the pattern was small. And as we got narrower and narrower with our slit width, the pattern got smaller and smaller. Uh, sorry, the pattern got broader and broader. So now let's have a look at single and double slits. We've already seen an indication that the double slit pattern, we can't make infinitely thin double slits. And so if we go, sorry, if we go far enough out, we end up with a dimming part again. And that is because these slits are not infinitely thin. If we look at a single slit, so the separation of these two double slits is D. If we look at our single slit of width W, this is the pattern that we see. So this single slit, the first destructive bit is here. And this is the double slit where the destructive bits are these smaller dark spots here. Now, if we make a double slit where each slit is the width of the single one, what we see is the pattern of the single slit overlaid on the pattern of the double slit. Mathematically, what we are doing here is we are what we call convoluting these two things together. And when we look at the diffraction pattern, that works out as a multiplication of the two patterns. So it works out as a multiplication of the two patterns. And so what this enables us to do is to predict lots of different behaviours depending on the apertures that we're seeing. So we're going to have a look at some interesting apertures in a second, but the bit I wanted to do when we were looking at single slits is I've been shining a light, a laser, through a hole. What's also interesting is you get the same effect if you shine a laser around a single obstacle. So at this point, where do I get a single obstacle that's narrower than the beam of a laser? Hmm, who would like to donate some hair? Okay, who would like, I've, I've got one I prepared earlier. Anybody like to donate a hair for me? I will need to put my glasses on for this. This is not the DNA part of the lecture. I'm not going to take the DNA out of your hair. Do we have one here? Yeah, I think you might need to try again. 
Anybody else? You do? Uh, okay, we've got one here. Marvellous. Thank you. Put my finger on it. And one more. Marvellous. Thank you. I have it. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is what I'm going to do is... Is that it is? Let's zoom out a little bit. So here's the one I prepared earlier. I have two kindly donated other ones, which I'm going to stick over the top. Try and keep it as straight as I can. And there is another one on my napkin here. And can anybody tell me from just looking, I'll show you in a second when I move it up a little bit, from just looking at this slide, which hair is the thickest? Any ideas? Okay, we think we've got some, this I'm going to call number one, the middle one is number two, and the outer one is number three. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to give that a go got some duplicates there so let me just get rid of the extraneous one which is proving a little tricky to do and now hopefully from the diffraction of the laser we should be able to spot the difference if there is one they might all be equal of course Highly unlikely, but they might. So here is, I'll just get them lined up and show you where number one is. Jacob, if you can remove the lights for me, please. So the main difference that you see is there is a bright dot at the center and that's how you can determine that it's an obstacle rather than a, an aperture. So that is hair number one. I'm now going to move across to hair number two. I'm blocking it for the moment because I don't want it to be passing through. Here's hair number two. Is the pattern wider or narrower, do we think? Any change or is it about the same? Okay, number three is closer to that one, so let's have a look. Here's number three. I think personally that one is a little bit wider than the one we saw previously. So if the pattern is wider, it's marginal. If the pattern's wider, what does that mean about the hair? It's slightly thinner, very, very slightly thinner indeed. Okay, so hopefully that has illustrated the point that actually when there is, even through potentially a microscope, negligible observable difference, we can actually, using diffraction, find out um, very, very small changes. So now, hopefully we've consolidated this idea that diffraction is an inverse relationship. So here we've got a letter H, that's the aperture, that's the hole that we're shining the laser through. And we can break it down as if it's two double slits with a width A and a horizontal single slit of a height H. So we have a horizontal pattern and we have a vertical pattern. So which bit do we think the horizontal pattern is due to? Is it due to the double slit or the single slit? It's due to the double slit. And so this horizontal single slit is giving us this pattern. So what I'd like you to think about is which of these letters 
represents the largest aperture size. So I think we can eliminate D, because that's clearly the biggest, right? That's the separation. So if D is the biggest, which feature is that contributing to in this diffraction pattern? D is the largest thing, which feature of the pattern is it creating? Yeah? Yeah, yourself, yeah? Yeah, the narrower dark lines in this horizontal pattern, these narrow dark lines are due to this size here. So if I know D, I know that this is inversely proportional to D. So okay, we now need to decide between A and H. So H is giving us this separation. A is giving us the bigger pattern here in this double slit pattern. So which is bigger, A or H? I'll ask you to put your hands up. Who thinks A is bigger than H? Who thinks the other way around, H is bigger than A? Good. Well done. The H is bigger than A because remember, the smaller feature on the pattern, so this separation is smaller than this separation here. And so where the separation is smaller, that's the bigger feature. Okay. So, I will um, show you that letter H for real in a minute, but while I am setting that up, I would like you to have a look at these. This was an experiment done in the Cavendish for fun. Um, and I'll show you a, a, a bigger slide in a minute so you can have a think about it. This is the diffraction pattern of 22 letters of the alphabet. And your challenge, which you're going to be able to vote for in a second, is which four are missing? Now, to make the challenge slightly easier, they are in alphabetical order. So they're not all muddled up, okay? So if, the, if you think this is A, this can't, uh, sorry, if you think this is C, this one can't be D. They are in the right order, okay? So while I set up the real letter H, you can vote on Slido, and there's... Thanks, Jake. Just for a moment, Jacob is going to blank the screens. Um, hopefully you can just about see it, um, it is quite a distance away. But as I, as I, there we go, that's a, a better line. So as I move my slit up and down, I can avoid the horizontal bar of the H. And we see that double slit pattern where each leg of the double slit has some width. So there are tiny, tiny dark lines in each bright spot there. And then there's a bigger overall pattern. And as I move down so that my laser is also going through the single slit part of the middle, you start to see that vertical diffraction pattern appearing as a result of the horizontal bar of the letter H. And so those tiny, tiny, tiny dark spots in the horizontal line are due to the separation of the legs of my H. 
The dark spots in the vertical line are due to the height of the, the bar of the H. And then the biggest feature, which is the dark spots horizontally, is due to the width of each of the legs of my H. So we will come back to more of that in a second. But while I am up here and give you time to think about your voting for your letters, I'm just going to show you the next part of where we're going. And we're going to circles now because circles in 2D are a very good um, approximation for atoms. And so I am going to show you a variety of patterns now that start with two circles. And just need to get that lined up. Let's see how we get on. Oh, find the things. There we go. So there's there's one circle. And then as I move across and start to engage the other circle, hopefully, you start to see just about that there is then a double slit diffraction pattern overlaid with a circle. And I will show you that again in a second with a real image, which is somewhat larger. OK, can you pop the lights back on, Jacob, please? <laughs> If your undergraduate degree in physics here in Cambridge in natural sciences is to spend six hours in a dark lab playing with diffraction so you get quite used to going in the dark and out of the dark quite a lot okay so let's have a look at your votes okay so you might have decided So I'll go back to the I'll go back to the letters for you. We're looking for four. Yeah. It, oh, do, when I go off it, does it stop? Okay. Apologies. There you go. So you're looking for four letters. Well, I'll give you a clue. Two of the letters in the top four are correct. In fact, three of the letters in the top four are correct. Okay, so I will go back to the pattern now. If you finish voting, let me just have a look down the list to see. I'll show you what the right answer is. I'll show you what the right answer is. So we're going to just quickly look through these. So what do I look for? Well, the angle, and this is relevant to the final step that we're going to make, which is to the structure of DNA. The angle of these is due to the arms of a letter A. Okay, so the letter A leg that's going that way gives this diffraction pattern. Remember, they're perpendicular to each other. Um, the diffraction pattern is perpendicular to the slit and this one here. So this is the A. And they are capital letters. I should have probably told you that. So they are capital letters. Um, so you imagine a B shape. You've got some circles in there. And I gave you a little hint to that when I showed you the circle before coming down to the front again. So this is, if you imagine a B, it's got some vertical bits, uh, uh, horizontal bars, it's got a vertical bar. So here's the diffraction pattern of the vertical bit of the B. Here's the curly bit of the two Bs. This is C, this is D. E is a vertical bar with three horizontal ones. So here's the vertical bar, here's the horizontal ones. Ah, somebody down here has said the next one is G. This is E, so what's missing? F. F. 
And I can understand why the decision between E and F might be tricky. There's only one line in it, right? Um, but you, that's the one that you did vote for that was correct. I think that was the second highest vote, F. So G, here's the H pattern that we've already seen. That would have been too easy if I'd have left that one out. This has got a curly bit in it. So which one do we think this might be? J. J. Therefore, if this is H and this is J, I is missing. Okay. So we've then got K. If we think about the legs of K, that's giving these two. L, M, O. And the M there is because I can actually see multiple parts rather than just a single. So an M would have an, a down and an up corresponding to these two, whereas an N only has one angled bit. So N is missing. And then the final one, so we've got N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, V. So U is missing. So F, I, N, and U were the ones that were missing. So now let's move on to, ultimately, how does all this help us determine the structure of DNA? Well, if we go from um, letters and slits to circles, this is a good model, 2D model of an atom. And so the relationship that I wanted you to remember was this inverse proportionality. The bigger my circle, the smaller the pattern. The smaller my circle or my atom, then the more spread out the pattern. And so the distance to these dark rings is determined by the size of my circle. And for those that have attuned eyes to these, what you saw on the screen briefly before I came down was indeed this pattern. And I should say thank you to Nikki because Nikki uh, actually helped me take these photographs in the lab. Uh, taking a photograph is not easy because uh, your, your phone or your camera adjusts for the low light. Uh, so it's not a, an easy thing to do. So just like double slits, but this time we've got circles instead of rectangles, the separation between the slits is the biggest feature of the aperture. So it's the smallest feature of the pattern. And then the circles are the smallest in the aperture, and so they are the biggest feature of the pattern. And so we can build this up, and we can start to have an array of circles. Now, I'm just going to take a step back to check that this is visible. From, it's better from a distance than it is up close. So in this pattern here, you can see a big dark ring, and then you can see little grids inside. So who can tell me what dimension of the aperture this big ring is due to, please? Who thinks it's A? Hands up. Who thinks it's D? Good, so we're getting the idea. Biggest feature, smallest bit of the aperture. And then this grid comes about because we've got a grid of separation D. Okay, so all of these atoms are separated by a distance d in a square array, and so we get a square diffraction pattern, which is the smallest feature of the pattern. Um, those of you that are having a go at Isaac Physics outside, really nice question related to this called Don't Brag. That comes from one of our scientists that were here at the Cavendish, in fact, father and son, William Henry and William Lawrence Bragg, that came up with this theory for crystals. So you imagine that these, uh, this square array is layers of a crystal, where we've got atoms in one layer, atoms in the next layer, atoms in the next layer. And so if we think about that idea we started with, the path that this, if we shine an x-ray, the x-ray that hits this atom travels this distance. The x-ray that comes in and hits this atom has traveled this extra length here. There is a path difference. And where there's a path difference that's equal to a whole number of wavelengths, we get a bright spot. And where there is a path difference equal to half a wavelength, then we get a dark spot. And what we can then do is we can convert that into a spectrum by scanning over the crystal. And here's the bright spot. 
and then we get dark spots, and then we get another bright spot. And just in the same way, depending on what angle you shine your X-rays at the crystal, it either is facing this slice of the crystal, or it's facing this slice of the crystal, or it's facing this slice of the crystal, all depending on which way we orientate the X-ray on the material sample. And so this big spike here is due to this one. This big spike here is due to the middle plane of atoms, and this one here is due to the uh, triangular plane of atoms. And when you do that, and you look at this as a sort of an array of dots for different crystals, these are the sorts of things you see. And the exactly the same principle, the intensity of the spot is due to um, the constructive interference of many different interactions of the X-rays from a given uh, atom. So here we are with DNA. And what are the features of DNA? Well, number one, it's a helix. And here's the second pun on the A to Z of DNA. There are different forms of DNA, A, B, C, and Z, and DNA, okay? And the differences between them are the separation between the helices, the angle of um, the, the structures between those two legs of the helices, and the shapes within them. So ZNA is a, a, a very sort of wavy helix. So I am going to try and show you this for real. The pictures are always better than what you can do in the experiment because uh, you're up close and personal. This is probably the hardest one to do. I have a tiny, tiny spring, which I have set up at the laser at the back. And hopefully I am going to show you this beautiful uh, X shape that you get. I'm going to see if you, why, why do you think it's an X? Why do you think these diffraction patterns are at an angle like an X? Anybody can I give it a go? You look at the helices. I can see lots of people doing this. Absolutely. So we've got a spiral of a helix, and the helix isn't horizontal, it's not vertical, it's at an angle. So one arm of the helix is causing this one, and one arm is causing this one. Anybody got any ideas why we see dark spots in between the pattern here? What does the pattern within this single thing make you think of? If you just looked at the one leg, looks like a something we've seen before. It's a bit like a double slit diffraction pattern, okay? Where the gaps between tell us about the separation and the larger pattern tell us about the width. So hopefully you can already start to see how we might decode the, um, the, the diffraction pattern. So I am going to try and do it for real. You will at least see the X shape, whether you will see the dark lines in between. That's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but let's see what we can do. So what you can see here, if I hold it up to Jacob's phone, is I have a tiny spring separated between two elastic bands. And the challenge is to get the laser lined up exactly with the helix of the spring. Now let's see how we get on. Okay. Let me just move it up a little bit. Okay, right. Lights, Jacob, please, if you will. So hopefully the X is pretty convincing. So teachers, clamp stand, laser pointer, spring, you're in business pretty much. That's, um, you, can, you can try this for yourself. And if you're on a screen closer to it, you may well actually see the, the dark lines in between. Um, you need a relatively small spring in order to have a go. But what you can see is as I scan my laser across the spring, Depending on whether the laser is lining up with the arms of the spring, the, the helices of the spring, you, you see that pattern come in and out as we're moving the laser across. And you also sort of see the V changes its dimension. 
it sort of is, is a wider angle or a narrower angle as you go across. And that is determined by the angle at which the, the laser is hitting the spiral of the spring. Okay. Thanks, Jacob. You can pop the light, lights on. I can remove that now. So the final step, really, is to just decode what we've de concluded already. So here we've got B DNA. And the interesting feature of B DNA is these uh, base pairs are horizontal. Okay? The helices aren't, obviously. They're at an angle here. And so here's, excuse me, here's the X-ray diffraction pattern. We use that uh, motto in our head, biggest feature in the aperture, smallest feature in the pattern. And so the angle of this X is due to the angle of tilt of each of the arms of uh, the DNA, the helices of the DNA. The smallest feature on here is the separation between the base pairs. And so that becomes the biggest feature in the diffraction pattern. So if we were to measure this, we would be able to calculate the separation of the base pairs in the DNA. And then we can look at the separation between the two helices, and we can look at the separation uh, between the repeat pattern. So this is one whole repeat of that particular spiral. That's that separation P, and that 1 over P, therefore, tells us about uh, if we measure this separation, that's telling us, if you like, the wavelength. It's not strictly true, but the, the separation before the helix repeats. So these dimensions here, this is 34 angstroms, 28 angstroms, 2 angstroms, 3 angstroms. That's 10 to the minus 10 meters can be determined as a result of this, um, uh, the ability to take diffraction patterns. And so the distinction between A-form DNA and B-form DNA is that the base pairs in A-form are no longer at uh, a horizontal angle. And that shows up in the feature of the diffraction pattern. So here's the, the B structure where these uh, base pair or nucleotide rods are horizontal. Let me move the um, mouse pointer, it's rather in the way there. You see, if you like, a slightly cleaner pattern in the, in the X-ray diffraction of the, of the B DNA. And then when we look at the A, because the rod is inclined, in this case at 65 degrees, you start to see these combinations of extra patterns appearing in the, in the diffraction. So this is a real X-ray image. One is B DNA and one is A DNA. So I'm going to reveal in a second, but I want you to vote who votes that the one on the left is A. Who thinks the fraction pattern on the left is A? And the pattern, who thinks it's B? Okay. It's got to be one or the other. You're absolutely right. You've got a 50-50 chance of getting this right. If we remember the distinction, it's the, it's the lack of horizontal. So the B is horizontal. And if we go back, the B pattern is slightly cleaner. It has fewer dots in it as a result of that horizontal pattern. So I'm afraid it is that way around. Okay. So apologies. I think I'm one minute over and I'm happy to take questions, but I do realize that many of you have to leave. That is our whistle stop tour of the A to Z of the structure of DNA. If you would like to tell us how you found it, then please do vote at Slido. Thank you.